Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, quick uh, explication of uh, uh, that uh, exercise in Presi. Uh, Ogun is a god of uh, Yoruba, god of creativity, uh, of the lyric, as well as of war, of uh, conflict. And uh, it so happened. Uh, I was wrong, by the way. Um, when you talked about the seven word bio, I had in mind the previous request for a 50 word bio. So, um, so I had to make that up immediately. But it came very easily for the simple reason that uh, I'll be talking about mythology tonight. And Ogun is one of the principal, uh, uh, one of the greatest myths in Yoruba uh, pantheon and cosmology. And I happen to be a disciple of Ogun. So that's it, a disciple of Ogun, but with crucial deviations. I've uh, never wholeheartedly embraced mentors. Uh, now, <coughs> Humpty Dumpty, yet on the wall. Uh, it found audience uh, relations always to begin on a sad note and then move on to euphoric cadences. So firstly, tragedy. I am, as many of you are aware, a compulsive mythologist, and nothing would have been more fulfilling than to stand here today and affirm a frankly delightful piece of mythology. It concerns the ancestor in whose name we are all gathered here today, and my own self, that ancestor being, of course, Arthur Miller. It has not been easy to bring myself to debunk that mythology, especially as it links me also to one of the greatest works of pulchritude that the cinema has ever celebrated, that being Marilyn Monroe, whom I never met in real life. Like any former prisoner, I remain deeply appreciative of the efforts of the literary world, human rights organizations such as Amnesty International, etc., to obtain my liberty from the Nigerian military government during the Biafran War of Secession. 1966 to 69. Those who doubt that these efforts are of immense value to the physical and moral welfare of the prisoner, even if they do not immediately lead to his or her release, should take the testaments of the prisoners themselves and of their immediate colleagues and relations a little more seriously. I could not receive any indication of these efforts through normal channels while incarcerated, but as with most prisons, news have a way of uh, percolating even the stoutest walls. I was aware that the world of letters had not forgotten my existence, and it mattered. Arthur Miller was at the forefront of agitators on my behalf, and I was able to thank him in person when we eventually met. However, and here comes the moment of deflation, I'm afraid my release had nothing to do with his being then married to Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> Since this anecdote kept cropping up, it still does, I became curious and checked, uh, checked the truth of it from impeccable sources, including from the man who signed both my detention and release orders. I'm afraid Marilyn Monroe had nothing to do with it. Now, if instead of signing and writing letters, Arthur Miller had dispatched Marilyn Monroe as his personal ambassador. <laughs> I'm convinced that I would have been released much earlier. <laughs> Since the pen is mightier than the sword, and beauty proved mightier than the pen, beauty would have shattered the general's swords in no time. I wish that were also true. From that sad note, albeit with uh, the uplifting tonalities of the pursuit of beauty in the creative enterprise, and we're not speaking here, of course, of physical beauty alone, we shall shift temporarily away from the mythological realm to the factual. But we shall be back. Factual is not, of course, equate indisputable. So let who will dispute the following claim, for which this platform, Penn International, is singularly appropriate and deserving. And so, to make up for the deprivation of the myth of the connubial weapon in the liberation of one writer, that very writer now lays personal claim to the liberation of entire peoples from dictatorship. A veritable tsunami that began in the Maghreb has swept through North Africa to the Middle East and is presently congealing, alas, as I write this, in the stubborn, blood-stained redoubts of Yemen, Libya, and Syria, 
among other slave plantations. I concede an enabling role to Penn International in this human transformation, but I insist on the lion's share for myself. The eruption of the contagious virus of change is deemed a revolutionary outbreak by some, others call it popular uprising, and others any number of names, the sum of which is known and understood by all as simply freedom. Mind you, even freedom has a rich and varied menu, none without its rationalizations. There is freedom to accept domination, freedom to accept powers, control over individual choice, will, including even the exercise of thought. Some scriptures actually propose that freedom can only be found in the act of submission. Reams of theological tracts have been devoted to that thesis, seminized from pulpits and every form of religious podium. <clears throat> There's freedom to listen also to the mockery of one's voice, bouncing back in diminishing echoes from walls controlled by the eyeless servitors of power. There's freedom to walk within the perimeter of walls rather than on the outside. Freedom even to meditate on the nature of walls, especially of the kind festooned with barbed wires, watchtowers bristling with guns, the circuit lined with anti-personnel mines, patrol stations, and invisible electronic gadgets, the many clones of the Berlin Wall. There's freedom to kowtow to power, freedom to project freedom onto walls of enclosure, but never actually breach such walls into other kinds of freedom. There's also the freedom of exile, which for some is no freedom at all, but a crippling form of constraint. Some writers have found freedom in collaboration with power. Others, however, experience freedom in the very impulse that makes them get on their broomsticks, levitate and charge, hopefully knock Humpty Dumpty off his gilded perch with all attendant risks. As an anguished ruler, once protested, what sort of freedom are these peasants talking about? Aren't they free to breed like rabbits within my domain? I see that I have already invoked one of my favorite accessories for delineating the writer's occupation, the broomstick, which of course is a property of witchery or sorcery, necromancy. I shall try and justify that co-option as we proceed, but first, we must proceed to the grounds of my statement of claim in the stakes of the recent tidal wave of liberation. In December last year, I fulfilled an invitation to deliver a lecture to the African Development Bank in Tunis, where the world media has testified it all began. Do take careful note as I proceed of the interlinkage of the dramatis personae of individual and institutional as well as mythological players as we pursue the unfolding of history propelled, aided, and abetted, as I said, by mythology, the classic kind this time. That bank, the ADB, has had quite a turbulent career. Its actual headquarters are in Abidjan, Ivory Coast, which some may recall, have been prominent on the world's radar of civil disturbances much further back than the most recent 2010-2011 edition might suggest. As a result of the earlier civil war that functionally split the nation in two, yes, over the very issue of electoral disenfranchisement seven years ago, numerous businesses and institutions wisely relocated to safety, the African Development Bank among them. A week or two before my departure for Tunis in December, I received a note from the Writers in Prison Committee of International Pen requesting that I use the occasion of my presence in that country to address the situation of literary life and of some imperiled Tunisian writers. Here's an excerpt from that address. It's a bit longish, but of course, it is not only pertinent to this occasion, but it also affords me the chance to report back to Penn that I did faithfully carry out my assignment. In Yoruba we say, that means it's he who sent it. The person who sends us on an errand whom we obey, not the person to whom we deliver it. So here goes. I said, I perceive no difference between secular conduct in 10,000 and 20,000 lives of humanity of both genders and from geriatrics to infants, often in the most sadistic manner. 
It is the word, the expression itself, when subverted to the service of such power-enabled bestialities that proves especially traumatizing. The mind, especially of an African raised within a continent whose apartheid policies lasted most of its maturing years, does not require much instigation to wonder how the language of urban sanitation differed from the policy of apartheid South Africa, which wiped out black habitations to create a cordon sanitaire between black urban settlements and the ruling white minority of that society. The language of apartheid was near identical. Society must be cleansed of the designated dregs of society. In reality, the poor but articulate dissidents suddenly rendered homeless by the hundreds of thousands. All that was left as they were herded in makeshift prisons was that primordial possession, the voice. It is this voice that is picked up by the poets, the urban songsters and their fellow beings, in proof of their human validation. Now, we're not speaking only of the celebrated literati uh, of their communities, not of the testimonies of their cosmopolitan protagonists at Penn and other international gatherings. No, we are speaking of that primordial which is coven, whose members transfigure the world, the virtual world, on which their spokesmen and women glide on broomsticks to lunge at Humpty Dumpty enthroned on his wall of deception, constriction, and domination. We're speaking of the denizens of that world who emerge from their degradation to speak in a language of their own, from whose inner community a number gather once in a while on occasions like this to compare notes, relishing, why not, the moments of a break from those zones of state-engendered urban sanitation, where humanity is not even allowed to stitch its rags and pluck out its fleas in peace, unless, of course, it first surrenders that primary possession, its transforming voice. It is the ploy of power and its acolytes to propose that such cosmopolitan voices are divorced from their origins, to propose that they are alienates who represent no one but themselves and their foreign toastmasters. The people, however, know the true source from which their language derives, and it is not the language of urban sanitation. We're speaking, for instance, if I may shift medium a little, of the inscriptions on the signs and mastheads of passenger lorries, taxis, and other forms of improvised public transport, which trundle over the rot and potholes and filth-lined tracks called roads, hurling goods and human cargo from farm to market and from drudgery to bare survival. I sometimes call them mobile murals and call attention to them, not merely on occasions such as this, but at the gatherings of rulers in my own continent. Some of you who have been to Africa may have traveled in those vehicles. They carry pithy summaries of their inmates' expectations and warnings to power and privilege. Expressions of protest and royal laments inserted into the gulf that separate their idyllic vista from the reality they are compelled to endure. One in particular you may have encountered on the bookshelves but without awareness of its origin. It goes, the beautiful, spelled T-Y, the beautiful ones are not yet born. That caption was appropriated with acknowledgement by Aikweyama, the Ghanaian novelist, for his novel that came out in the 60s, a scatological indictment of Ghana's corrupt reality at the time, a truthful elaboration of that saying, since Aikwe knew at first hand the terrain that had produced that shorthand of a pessimistic, lamentable actuality. Here's another from my Yoruba part of the world. It goes, Ewenla kuniruwewe. It means, the falling leaf, however large, shall not crush the smaller. Watch the example of the big leaf, Mr. Big Man, says that painter poet. When it detaches, it simply floats gently to the ground and settles over the smaller one even protectively, not bruising it, not crush it, simply because it is bigger. Another 
in broken English. Chop small, quench small. Chop big, quench big. Which is obviously addressed to our Humpty Dumpties who eat up a nation's resources, indifferent to the consequences. Chop means eat. Eat small, die small. Quench means die. But eat big, die big. That shorthand rivals for its prophetic succinctness another which remains my all-time favorite, a caution that has yet to be taken to heart by the practice survivors so far of the hurricane of change. It seems to be the favorite also of all the West African countries I've visited, and it goes, no condition is permanent. Yes, we're speaking of those voices, of the frustrated and disenfranchised, whose street troubadours seize the opportunity of Barack Obama's ascendancy to power in the United States to launch a song that went, it is easier for a Luo to become president of the United States than to be president of Uganda. The language of that song was played enough for even the dumbest audiences, but the lesson was not taken to heart. Uganda underwent the most horrifying outbreak of urban violence bordering on the very collapse of humanity. And yet, Ngugi wa Thiongo, Michere Mugo, and others had also warned in extended parables and direct polemics, giving voice to the season of discontent that had begun to stretch into an eternity. Arab Moy's prisons and detention laws had only built up behind them the tidal waves that eventually engulfed Uganda. The unheeded voices reverted to their primordiality, where articulation was no longer capable of modulation. Oh yes, indeed, there's always been a life and death contest for the appropriation of the human voice, a contest that takes many forms. The canonical text, for instance, secular and, or divine, has proved perhaps the most deadly of these control ploys. The ultimate word, whose very raison d'etre, demands that nothing is left for any other human to utter or think. In our technological age, this is accompanied by closure of alternative channels and even seizure of communication resources. The world's ideological behemoths from Stalin to Pol Pot or the Chinese Gang of Four, etc., made it their life mission to stifle and extinguish such textual propositions as did not adhere to theirs. The Bible, the Quran, from long manuals, Hindu or Buddhist texts, while those, some of those at least, in turn, did their best to repay the compliment wherever they were established. The Taliban, for instance, on overrunning Afghanistan, displayed one of the crassest instances of textual jealousy. But then they had precedent for which one need not travel as far back in antiquity as the Roman Catholic index. Apartheid South Africa, for instance, with a list of banned books, or Malawi, uh, censorship list under Hastings Banda, etc., etc. All poor cousins of communism's internal and mutually destructive literary controls. Consider the amount of anti literary energy that was expended over works, over which works of literature were ideologically correct or incorrect. The latter grouped summatively as reactionary, on dialectic products of false consciousness, etc., etc. Variations of these uh, contests survive till today in many parts of the third world. Extreme disciples of which still roam the jungles, the mountain fastnesses, or urban settlements of Nigeria, armed with definitive texts and other products of textology that explicate the history and destiny of mankind from birth to death and excommunicate all others. One such surfaced in Nigeria quite recently, calls itself Boko Haram, translated as death to all books. Um, except, of course, only one theirs. It's quite a young career has already resulted in the extermination of hundreds, some of you may have read, and the rampage goes on till today. Only my book, none else. Muhammad Gaddafi could not wait to get in on the act. 
Many people believe that he remains simply obsessed with power and domination of the political kind, yes, unquestionably. But we tend to ignore the fact that he was also a writer. Oh yes, he did write. Remember the Green Book? That dead on arrival testament on which he spent the revenue from millions of barrels of oil to promote as a great rival to other super texts such as Chairman Mao's Red Book or the Communist Manifesto. That was the first primary and prophetic fall of that Humpty Dumpty. The attempt to turn a juvenile tract into an exegetical text for all ages with a lavishly funded international conference staged in this very country where the great guru graciously beamed his voice via satellite. It is good for us that dictators also insist on their own freedom to write. The world remains the most accommodating vehicle. The word, I beg your pardon, the word remains the most accommodating vehicle for human communication. Hence, its centrality in the evolution of social man. Man did not develop language simply because he had the highest developed speech organs. That development commenced simply because man needed to communicate an activity that takes place even without the physiological organs of speech. This by no means diminishes the power of the word itself, even on the inanimate or invisible. Examples, the famous Hittite Luwian tablet ex uh, exhumed quite recently with writing that was addressed directly to the then rampaging plague, imploring it to leave town. Like the, like the tablet, the traditional healer in my own society, for instance, let's say he had to treat a snake bite. He'd make an incision, rubs the spot with some herbal extract, but then he'll proceed to bombard the venom in the bloodstream with incantations. What is he saying, in effect, but in far more lyrical, of course, evocative language is, hey, you villainous son of a snake, I know you are in there, come out at once and leave this man in peace. In some Islamic usages, Quranic texts are made to serve a similar purpose. Only they are written, not orally delivered, never mind that they end up being orally imbibed. The text goes on a slate, is washed into a bowl, part of it is then rubbed on the patient's head, face, etc., while the rest is given to him to drink. Obviously, if the text did not matter, his patient would just have been treated with the uh, swallow of the ink directly, without its transformation into written religious commands. No matter the culture, one finds that from time immemorial, communication has been developed to the highest levels of even the therapeutic arts. Communication with the world or the inanimate in an animistic world, or indeed among religions, which look down on the belief systems of the world of animism or ancestor worship, yet firmly acknowledge the existence of unseen forces, all these place all such societies on the same level of reverence for the potency of the word. They all acknowledge the existence of invisible forces with whom logically forms of communication must be devised, oral, written, or symbolic. Humanity, it is clear, has never been content to communicate only with his own immediate neighbor. We know that even prayers are not necessarily spoken. Prayer wheels and scrolls are a feature of a number of Asian religions, just as some prayers are painted onto kites and then released into the wind. With such undeniable universality, versatility, indeed transcendentalism in man's need to communicate with his kind and even with other worldly species, is it really conceivable that the word can be left to the provenance of a minority, a self-appointed, power elitist, rapacious, unrepresentative, and often unconscionable minority, the attempt will always be made, somewhere, somehow, and persistently. And so the battle lines, or walls of contestation, contestation, remain drawn between Humpty Dumpty and the witches come sorcerers of the world. Despite your watchtowers proclaim the latter, the word shall fly. And they shall win this battle, 
as they have won it again and again, despite losses, despite setbacks, despite a numbing sense of a Sisyphean, Sisyphean curse, fighting the same battle over and over again. They are energized, however, because the very mobility of the masthead inscription on the conveyance that takes the witches to battle has summed it all up. Like claims for the origin of language itself, that inscription is native to the people of a continent that contested the arrogance of colonialism. It was transported into a Europe demarcated by the inhumanity of the Berlin Wall, returned to the southern part of the African continent in a renewed assault on the walls of apartheid, newly shimmers across the North African landscape from where it has leapt a fireball into the Middle East. In short, continues to carry the battle to spaces of freedom-deprived humanity, spaces hitherto thought impregnable. And at base, nothing more mysterious than a simple, poetic, and prophetic inscription that reads, no condition is permanent. Or, to try to be a little more original, not so mellifluous, but most suited to a culture of car stickers, dump, dumpty. Thank you.